who are talking about the various costs and consequences of the United States post 9-11 wars. There are several other events in this series, but uh, what we're going to do today is get started with Dr. Ken McLeish, who's going to talk to us about post 9-11 veterans in the U.S. justice system. And I'll just give you a little background on Professor McLeish. She's an associate professor of medicine, health, and society, and anthropology at Vanderbilt University, which is in Nashville. He's uh, the author of a book called Medical Anthropology. I'm sorry, different book. <laughs> He's the author of, a, of a, an important book um, called Making War at Fort Hood. Life and Uncertainty in Military Community, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2013. He's gonna to talk to us today for about 25 minutes. Now, if you'd like to post your questions anytime, that's fine. In fact, it's probably better since there's a little bit of a delay. So without further ado, Dr. McLeish. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nita, for that introduction. And um, thanks so much to the Party Center and uh, to the Costs of War Project for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion and, um, uh, and to be a part of this, uh, this bigger project. The thing I'm going to talk about today is what it might mean to understand veterans and service members uh, law-breaking, arrest, and involvement in the criminal justice system as a cost of war. And in the U.S. frequently, we kind of treat veteran or military status as a sort of determining or predisposing or even causal factor in criminality, arrest, and incarceration, uh, especially in relationship to violent crime. And, uh, and often linked uh, linking those things explicitly or by implication uh, with mental illness and substance use. And uh, one of the things we're going to explore today or that this talk is going to explore today is how well this association is or isn't borne out by available evidence and what some of the effects are of the current ways that we tend to frame veteran involvement in the criminal justice system in the U.S. Now, uh, like Nita mentioned, I'm a cultural anthropologist and the focus of my study is the uh, experiences of current and former service members in military communities. Um, and also uh, something that I look at in my work are the ways that American society attaches value and meaning to war through the ways that it uh, uh, conceives and perceives soldiers and veterans. And from this perspective, one of the things that uh, I'm going to argue in this talk today is that a focus on veteran status as a driver of criminality, even when that focus happens in the context of sensitive and thoughtful um, discourses or representations or call, calls for aid to soldiers, uh, for instance, in the, the kind of reporting that um, we saw from the New York Times during a sustained period in the 2000s and early 2000s as part of a series called War Torn that's depicted on the, on the slide here. Even in, um, in uh, really thoughtful and deeply engaged uh, representations of veteran experience like this, focusing on veteran status as a kind of causal factor can all too easily obscure other factors uh, that, are, uh, that help explain incarceration and justice involvement, while at the same time risking reproducing a sort of stereotypical image of veterans as on the one hand, especially dangerous and threatening to civilian society, and on the other hand, especially heroic, uh, morally elevated and especially deserving or maybe more deserving than other members of society. And, uh, you know, as, a, as an anthropologist, as I think about this stuff, one of the things I'm interested in is the way that our cultural norms around war shape our policy, and then our policy then in turn comes to sort of reflect back to us uh, a vision that highlights some costs of war and potentially obscures or distracts our attention from others. Uh, so over the course of this talk today, the way I'm going to do this um, is, uh, uh, is by doing three different things. The first of these is to survey some basic background on veteran involvement in the US criminal justice system, showing and describing the extent to which 
um, exist our existing understanding of these things supports or not the idea that veteran status and war experience are determinative of criminality. And also noting some other aspects of the US criminal justice system that are not accounted for by war or military status as a kind of causal driver of crime and incarceration. The next thing I'm going to do is discuss the recent rise of uh, a, a kind of um, judicial system innovation called a called veteran treatment courts or VTCs. And this is a form of civilian judicial program that diverts low level veteran offenders from jail uh, in favor of a court supervised rehabilitative program and often with great success helps veterans uh, who might otherwise have ended up in jail access benefits and healthcare and move forward without the burden of a criminal record. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is share some insights from my own ethnographic field work conducted in um, recent years uh, in a military community uh, and specifically in a veteran treatment court in that military community that served a large population of post 9-11 veterans. And among the many things that this work revealed, and I won't have time in the, the talk portion of the talk to, um, to discuss uh, all this stuff that I've learned and that I've been thinking about, but I would, I would welcome the chance to talk about that in the Q&A. In the talk, though, I'm going to specifically focus on um, the way that this work revealed the importance of military policies and practices uh, as kind of central factors in the stresses that confronted many recent veterans and led to or were other or very in various ways involved in their arrest and incarceration and involvement in the justice system. So uh, looking first to uh, veterans in the US criminal justice system overall. Uh, and, and first, just to sort of flag here um, that uh, uh, existing data on veteran criminal justice involvement in the US is complicated, it's incomplete, um, it's, it's rather vast and extensive, but frequently challenging to generalize about, and it often seems contradictory. Um, there are a couple important reasons for why this is that I think are actually really crucial pieces of context for this broader question of veteran justice involvement as cost of war. One um, reason uh, for this complexity is the fact that U.S. veterans themselves are a tremendously large, diverse, and complex population. There are slightly over 20 million veterans in the U.S. currently, or, or, or rather there were in 2020. Uh, about two-thirds of those veterans are um, 55 and older. So about three-quarters of those veterans served in the pre-9-11 era. Uh, and uh, and around uh, and, and a remaining quarter, around 4.5 million veterans, uh, served in uh, the, the post 9/11 era. Uh, one of the other reasons that generalizing about veteran justice involvement is complicated is because the U.S. as a country has a uniquely vast and uh, also uniquely punitive criminal justice system. There are 2.3 million incarcerated people in the US, or rather I should say there were in 2020, and an additional 6.7 million people under judicial supervision, that's as um, uh, probation and parole. Uh, and those figures come from the Prison Policy Initiative. This figure is numerically more than uh, any other country in the world. Um, the US's nearest rival for number of incarcerated people is China, which uh, has uh, about um, three quarters of our number of um, imprisoned people uh, in the country, but of course it has about four times the population. And I really can't overstate uh, the potential importance of understanding the unique character of the US judicial, uh, excuse me, the US justice system as a feature for how we would want to characterize veteran involvement in the justice system. Um, it's difficult to talk about why specific Americans end up in prison without talking about the American choice to imprison large numbers of people in the first place. Uh, so with that said, um, just to sort of briefly characterize some things that it, that it is possible to say about veteran involvement in, uh, in the justice system. Uh, in 2020, there were approximately 181,000 uh, veterans in prison and jail in the United States. They represented 8% of the incarcerated population, which also means that they are present in the incarcerated population in lower proportion than they are present in the, the U.S. population overall. 
And in fact, vets are less likely than civilians to be arrested and jailed. Um, they're arrested and jailed at 50% the rate of civilians for all offenses and at two thirds the rate of civilians for violent offenses. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, among incarcerated veterans, uh, veterans from the post 9-11 era are slightly overrepresented compared to their peers from earlier eras. Uh, but the, the vast majority of incarcerated veterans are folks who served in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, that is in the immediate wake of the Vietnam era and in a period in the 80s and 90s where the U.S. was sporadically involved in conflicts, but uh, a period of time that I think most Americans think of as, as uh, nominally peacetime. Uh, that's, the, that's the bulk again about um, uh, uh, the bulk of uh, the incarcerated veteran population. Uh, I also want to note that the rate of incarceration among veterans and the total number of, uh, of incarcerated veterans has consistently declined uh, since the 1970s, including during the past 20 years of, uh, uh, during the post 9-11 era. Um, the, uh, the graph on the screen here shows just one sort of illustration of this, and this is um, drawing from a series of really excellent studies by uh, Bronson and colleagues of veteran incarceration rates um, uh, from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And uh, what this chart shows is in the blue bars, the proportion, uh, or excuse me, the, the proportion of veterans in the US population as a whole. And then in the orange and gray bars, the proportion of veterans that make up the uh, uh, the population of, of folks in prison and jail. And so it's possible to see here how in 1978 and 1985, um, veterans were actually overrepresented in prison and jail compared to the rest of the population. But the beginning in the late 1990s, and again, continuing throughout the post 9-11 era, veterans are actually underrepresented in prison and jail, a trend which uh, can, the latest data here is 2016, but actually, um, uh, Professor Bronson or Dr. Bronson uh, suggested in a, a recent conversation I had with her that this pattern has basically endured uh, through 2020, um, this rate of uh, a lower veteran incarceration compared to the civilian population. So um, in thinking about all this, uh, does war beget criminality and crime? Is war uh, the, the sort of causal driver here? Uh, there are a lot of ways to unpack and answer this question, and I, I don't uh, um, I don't want to pretend to be sort of answering it definitively, um, but there are a lot of uh, sort of blanket, uh, very important blanket claims that I think it is possible to make. The first of those claims comes from uh, Richard Culp and colleagues. Uh, these are sociologists who authored a, a comprehensive study of veteran justice involvement that was published a few years ago. Um, that uh, identified various patterns in arrest and incarceration and in an offense, but found that overall military service in general is not predictive of incarceration. And an additional uh, uh, comment that I, I feel it's incredibly important to add on top of this, simply because of the pervasiveness of narratives of war-related and trauma-related veteran criminality, um, the vast majority of veterans the vast majority of veterans with PTSD and other service-related uh, uh, psychiatric diagnoses do not commit crimes and do not commit other violent acts. Um, and I, this is I, this is something that I feel it's really strong, really important to keep in mind in the face of the strong rhetorical and cultural associations that we frequently see um, linking these things. So uh, what associations is it possible to, um, to note or observe or have been substantiated by, by various um, uh, research studies? Uh, veteran offenders are more likely than civilian offenders to have been told by a mental health professional that they have a mental illness. Uh, though, of course, there we would also want to keep in mind that um, mental health care in U.S. prisons is substantially uh, underfunded and, uh, and underserves the incarcerated population, and that there are high rates of mental, uh, of mental illness uh, and un untreated and unresolved uh, or insufficiently treated mental health problems among incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people in the U.S. Um, veteran offenders... Uh, uh, are more likely than civilian offenders to have committed a violent crime. 
But again, veterans in general, including veterans who commit violent crimes, are still uh, less likely than civilians to have committed a violent crime. Um, uh, there are some mixed associations that a range of different studies have found between military status, deployment experience, combat experience, and interpersonal violence, violent crime, or, or incarceration. Um, so for instance, um, uh, some studies have found higher rates of criminal offense uh, actually among troops who did not deploy compared uh, with troops uh, who did deploy um, from the same, uh, same installation. Um, other uh, studies have found, like the uh, Cezure and colleagues uh, study that's um, uh, cited on the screen here, did find um, slightly elevated odds of uh, violent behavior like getting in fights or, um, uh, or getting arrested uh, associated with deployment experience, uh, but the, the, the elevated odds were relatively small, like a matter of a couple of percentage points um, compared to non-deployed personnel. Uh, there are some, uh, some mixed but potentially quite concerning um, patterns of uh, uh, specific subsets of veteran populations um, that, uh, that certainly merit careful attention. Um, some studies have documented uh, elevated odds of arrest, including for violent offense, um, for folks with specific sets of traumatic brain injury or PTSD symptoms. Um, some studies have also identified elevated risk for domestic assault or intimate partner violence among some subsets of uh, folks diagnosed with traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder. At the same time, other studies have, uh, uh, have found uh, evidence that, uh, that veterans are actually less likely than their civilian counterparts uh, to, um, to have committed uh, uh, domestic assault or in the partner violence. Um, so this is certainly an area that merits uh, further careful study. Um, and across all of these areas, the, the, just something that I would uh, I would want to uh, remind folks of is the way that uh, that there are other sort of non-military or non-service related factors that um, public health and epidemiological literature uh, uh, reveals are associated with some of these sort of uh, violent crime outcomes. So things like gender and specifically male gender, um, alcohol use and substance use, access to weapons, and a, a number of other factors that uh, may frequently overlap with veteran status, but are hardly limited to it or reducible to it, um, are also across American society drivers of some of these similar, um, uh, some of these kinds of patterns of, uh, uh, of offense and incarceration. Now, a final thing I wanna mention just about the broader context of the US criminal justice system is that the, the, the narrative of war as a kind of causal or determinative, fact, determinative factor in crime elides the way that the criminal justice system is not a neutral force in terms of who gets locked up and who is uh, who's targeted for arrest and who is, um, uh, who is sentenced in more sustained or punitive ways. Uh, there's a, a very robust body of scholarship that um, reveals uh, long-term and abiding inequalities in the U.S. justice system along class and especially along racial lines. Um, uh, th this is both part of the long scope of American history and is in more recent decades directly linked to policies uh, attached to things like uh, the war on drugs and the war on crime beginning in the 1970s. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about some of this stuff in detail in the Q&A, but for the moment, I would just want to flag that uh, the, um, these, uh, these recent, uh, uh, these last several decades of practices in the U.S. justice system have targeted uh, marginalized uh, civilians, again, along the lines of race, uh, class, but also things like disability or um, uh, being unhoused or substance use status. Uh, at the same time as various uh, social supports have been uh, systematically reduced. Um, and the, you know, veterans live in this same American society and are members of many of these same marginalized or targeted categories. Um, and, uh, uh, and actually even in the, um, uh, you know, the, the current moment, many of the same uh, policies that uh, that expose uh, people of color and especially black people in the United States um, to uh, uh, increased uh, 
uh, attention, uh, use of force, and uh, and lethal violence from police. Um, these these factors and these policies also target veterans as well. Uh, and just one sort of figure to kind of bring this into relief or into focus, um, Black and Latinx veterans are significantly less likely than their civilian counterpart, Black and Latinx counterparts to be arrested, but they're still two to five times more likely than white veterans to be arrested. Uh, and so I would also suggest here that we need to place any discussion of veteran criminality and incarceration in this broader context of who is targeted and who is criminalized by the US justice and law enforcement systems. Um, and the uh, December 2020 police assault on Army Lieutenant Karan Nazario is just one vivid example of this. And in fact, folks who have closely um, attended to uh, the, the pattern of lethal police violence against Black men uh, in the U.S. over the last several years will have noted that there's actually a, a number of military veterans and, and uh, 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 service members um, who are, are part of uh, that, uh, that collection of folks um, who, uh, who died at the hands of police. So, um, okay, let's see. So moving on to the, the next thing uh, that I wanted to cover here, which is um, questions about uh, what happens when veterans do enter the criminal justice system. And this, um, this relatively recent innovation in the form of the Veteran Treatment Court. Uh, Veteran treatment courts are civilian courts in which military offenders with relatively minor charges can participate in court super, super excuse me court supervised rehabilitation, typically a program that lasts 12 to 18 months or so, instead of going to jail. Uh, on successful completion, they frequently receive a reduced or expunged record, and uh, over the course of participation also um, are aided in accessing a range of different uh, veteran um, services and benefits. These courts are based on civilian treatment courts um, designed to work with uh, drug using offenders or offenders with uh, severe mental illness. The first of these courts were established in 2008, and there are currently as many as 500 of them located in, dif in different kinds of courts across the US. Uh, the courts, the veteran treatment courts also aim to uh, generate a supportive veteran specific environment that frequently also includes court personnel like case managers um, or uh, and uh, volunteer veteran mentors, but sometimes also even law enforcement personnel or lawyers who themselves have military experience and are veterans. Um, and the, the premise uh, in the, um, the words of organizations like Justice for Vets, which is the primary credentialing and advocacy organization for veteran courts in the US, is that recent veterans in particular are at elevated risk of service-related mental illness and substance use that can lead to criminal justice involvement and that can be successfully interrupted by a non-carceral judicial alternative and connection to veteran resources. And I just wanna note the way that this logic um, on the one hand sort of reproduces this causal narrative of war and military status leading to justice involvement, but at the same time, it also pushes back on carceral severity uh, and the, the kind of excessively uh, punitive character of the US justice system and advocates for this idea that, um, that jail and incarceration uh, may not be the thing that is most helpful uh, to people confronted with or responding to extremely stressful circumstances um, and without sufficient resources to respond to them. Uh, veteran treatment courts have been able to boast much higher non-recidivism rates in many instances than uh, similar courts in the regular justice system. Uh, a national level study by uh, the by American University, um, that's, you can see the cover of it on the slide here, found an average of around an 85% or so non-recidivism rate in veteran treatment courts among those who successfully completed the program. And this is compared to non-recidivism rates below 50% in comparable domains of the civilian justice system. So a really, a really substantial delta in terms of results that many of these courts are able to claim. Uh, and some of this study and other uh, similar studies have also found measurable improvements in participants access to care, uh, excuse me, health care, um, access to housing, access to other uh, veteran benefits and access to PTSD treatment. 
So veteran courts are also not without their complications uh, and, uh, and not without um, their, uh, their critics or critical observers. Um, one kind of basic fact about them is, is uh, that across these 500 or so programs nationwide, um, they are implemented in uh, often in very, very different ways in very different kinds of courts and with very different kinds of resources and training to sort of back them up. And, uh, and that one thing that um, commentator, that uh, veteran court researchers frequently note is that there are just major gaps in systematic data and research on these programs. Uh, making it difficult to generalize uh, beyond a certain point about what they are capable of doing and what other measures or supports they might need to be more successful. Uh, but some specific um, uh, uh, potential sort of hazards or shortcomings that some uh, critics have identified uh, include the fact that in some programs, uh, there is actually uh, participants were actually um, potentially going to spend more time in jail as a kind of intermittent sanction for violating program requirements than they would have in the regular criminal justice system. Uh, some studies have also suggested uh, some potentially concerning racial disparities in terms of uh, veterans' access to courts and the way that um, uh, uh, veterans of color were uh, treated um, or, um, uh, or, or able to be retained in court programs. Uh, so a high proportion of, of court programs nationally um, identified in the American University uh, uh, survey um, turned out to serve um, almost exclusively white populations of veterans, suggesting that there might be an unmet need among veterans of color uh, for greater access to these kinds of programs. And in uh, some uh, studies of some specific programs found that non-white participants were much more likely to be punished, much more likely to be rearrested during the program and much more likely to be kicked out. Um, some observers have also suggested that uh, veteran treatment courts that elect to accept uh, domestic assault um, uh, offenders uh, may uh, potentially be further exposing or, or aggravating the vulnerability of domestic assault victims. Um, and then just sort of a more general point about these courts is that uh, they, um, they rely on a sort of narrative of veteran exceptionalism, uh, an idea on the one hand of kind of civilian indebtedness to veterans, but also a, a sort of narrative that's documented across a lot of uh, literature on the military and American culture um, that attributes superior, superior moral characteristics to um, current and former service members. And pointing this out is not to object to those attributions or just to suggest that they're unearned or not, you know, not appropriate in any one case or another, but in the, case, in the, in the context of a judicial system, um, it suggests that a, you know, you know, a punitive and in many ways kind of fundamentally unjust system might be fine for some people, but that veterans as a sort of specially elevated uh, and especially deserving uh, population um, should be accepted from this treatment. And this is a, um, this is kind of a tendency that uh, uh, scholars and critics of treatment courts in general have noted that even as these kinds of courts carve out a sort of more for forgiving, more supportive or more accommodating space in the justice system, they don't necessarily critique the terms of the justice system as a whole. Um, and, uh, and, and potentially sort of normalize the idea that, uh, uh, that its routine operation is otherwise acceptable. Um, and one final uh, note, uh, something that's not um, flagged on the slide here, uh, but that kind of contradicts this narrative of exceptionalism, is that one compelling finding of some of the national level surveys of veteran courts is that these courts are most effective, uh, or, or, that, or rather the, that many of the, much of the efficacy of these courts derives from the fact that they are able to connect participants to robust healthcare and welfare resources, which exist for veterans in the form of uh, veteran benefits administered by the Veterans Health Administration. Um, there are not necessarily parallel sets of resources for civilian uh, offenders or for, um, you know, or, or, or for civilian uh, society more broadly in the US. Um, and, uh, and so I would just, as a kind of takeaway here, would want to flag the way that VTCs are remarkable, not only for their recognition uh, of veteran needs and their delivery of uh, life improving and life saving aid, um, and the compassion and commitment of their proponents and staff members, 
but also for their advancement of the idea that incarceration is not the best way to respond to law breaking that's rooted in mental distress, um, substance use, and stressful or disadvantaged life circumstances. But I would also want to suggest that it's important to situate these claims not only in the kind of contradictory and still developing evidence uh, around veteran courts, um, but also in the broader assumptions about deservingness, punishment, and state benefits that kind of structure and inform them. So the last thing I want to say a quick word about here um, uh, is uh, my own ethnographic uh, research um, and what some of these um, kind of macro level factors look like at the micro level in everyday life. Um, in recent years, I, I conducted several years of field work in a military community that I refer to pseudonymously as Holford. Um, this is a small uh, military town next to uh, um, uh, uh, nearby to a military base region with a large population of post 9 11 vets. And um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time getting to know folks uh, in this community um, over the uh, uh, over the last several years, including a lot of time um, observing the, uh, the regular work of a veteran treatment court in this community. And as an anthropologist, um, what I'm looking at in this work are the ways that people sort of live with the everyday challenges of new veteran status, including things like service-related injury and disability and mental health, um, uh, the challenge of accessing benefits and adjusting to civilian life, challenges to personal life that are occasioned by post-service transition. And a lot of the things that I find in this work reveal how these intimate and everyday aspects of veteran experience reflect broader cultural assumptions about war in the US and some of these broader uh, structural patterns um, uh, of, uh, of military policy and um, uh, and uh, the way that our civilian institutions are organized as well. Um, and uh, uh, so let's see, so just so one specific finding from this setting that I, I wanna highlight before wrapping things up is the uh, unique and powerful and distinctive role played by uh, military policy itself in many, uh, uh, many veterans' experiences of sort of entering the justice system in this specific community and this um, specific court. Uh, so beginning in the 2010s, uh, the military overall and the army in particular began to downsize and restructure. And as a part of this downsizing and restructuring, the uh, commanders down to uh, some of the low, the, the um, you know, sort of smallest unit level of command, uh, began to use things like substance use, um, previous use of mental health services, and low-level arrests as a basis for identifying risky soldiers um, who should be kicked out or not allowed to, uh, not invited to re-enlist. Um, and the ways that these, uh, these um, personnel decisions could look in person were frequently seen kind of perverse or, or contradictory. Um, folks who I got to know in my research would describe circumstances where you know, in the late 2000s, um, uh, DUI might be uh, moderately punished, but um, people, soldiers would be retained and cared for so that they could deploy with their units to perform necessary jobs. But that even a few years later, a new offense or even renewed attention to that previous offense could, would be invoked as the basis for not allowing them to re-enlist or punitively kicking them out um, in ways that could also jeopardize their, their future access to benefits. Um, the way that one of the case managers in the Holford Veteran Court expressed this to me, um, and this is uh, someone who was himself a veteran and also worked in Afghanistan as a contractor and worked in, in law enforcement um, locally, he said, um, you know, when they kick guys out and, uh, and take away their benefits, uh, you just made it a community problem, and it doesn't have to be like that. So... Uh, one of the things that I, I suggest this, uh, this is, is significant for is that it shows that the effects of war trauma and individual coping strategies are potentially inseparable from uh, the military prerogative to, uh, to kind of limit its responsibility to its own soldiers. And so the things that I observed in the Holford Court, um, you know, showed these trajectories where folks were profoundly affected by their war experience and by the stresses of service. But those war experiences and, and stresses and even traumas 
were not readily separable from these military uh, policies um, that guided retention or, um, uh, or the kicking out or limiting of, of benefits access for uh, a lot of these personnel. Um, and the court's role in this was really interesting because they could they were in a great position to support um, service members as they contended with these situations. But of course, a small municipal court is not, especially in a in a town with uh, a large military presence, is is hardly the uh, the kind of entity that is empowered to actively intervene in military in large scale military policies like this. So, just as a couple of takeaways to wrap things up for the moment. Um, I do want to emphasize that I think it's really important to recognize veteran criminality as a cost of war, kind of keeping in the theme of this program. Uh, we can think of that cost in terms of the personal dignity of, um, of uh, the people who are incarcerated. Uh, we can think of it in terms of potential danger to public safety or to other people um, by violent offenders. We can think about the economic cost of imprisonment. We can think about the moral cost to society of unjust uh, Im imprisonment and punishment. But I also really, really want to suggest the importance of being wary of the putative chain of causes that produces this sort of figure of the, uh, this, this sort of stereotypical figure of the, of the criminal veteran in which war experience is presumed to directly beget substance use and mental illness, which then directly begets violence and law breaking. And I would like to suggest as a kind of alternative framing that it's not so much war in itself, that produces crime and incarceration, but rather institutions, institutions in this case, like the military on the one hand and the criminal justice system on the other hand, against a background of racial inequality and class stratification in the United States. It's these institutions that expose people to violence and then, uh, and then punish people for suffering the effects of that violence. Um, VTCs intervene in this space in a really interesting and compelling way by suggesting that jail is not the best outcome for many people. And, uh, and this, I think this is a very compelling and humane argument in the context of, a, uh, in many ways, a very unjust system. Um, VTCs are also uniquely suited to, uh, to provide uh, kind of um, uh, expert knowledge on uh, the actual uh, military and veteran life mechanisms that are going to be directly relevant to, um, uh, to veteran offenders. Uh, but I, I do also want to flag the way that um, the narrative around these courts frequently suggests a kind of fragmentation or stratification of resources um, for incarcerated people and people who need state services uh, about sort of who deserves them and who is more uh, worthy of them. And so we might ask also what the costs are of so severely restricting uh, access to more forgiving or more accommodating approaches of the, in the justice system, but also uh, restricting access to state benefits and services more generally, rather than simply making these things more broadly available to all people in American society. Uh, and so also in lieu of any kind of specific policy recommendation, I'll just conclude by asking how we might envision military accountability itself as an aspect of veteran justice, and correspondingly, how we might envision public or civic accountability for welfare and justice systems that are so often underfunded, stingy, and punitive. Um, and uh, yeah, and with that, I will. Oh, and and uh, finally, I just want to highlight that you know, especially uh, right now, um, uh, we just yesterday learned about uh, the scheduled or supposedly scheduled full withdrawal of. US troops from Afghanistan, maybe perhaps potentially marking an official end uh, to the end of, uh, to, you know, to that particular conflict. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but even as these wars are nominally ending, our societal response to veteran needs is really just beginning um, that the, this generation of, of veterans uh, is, uh, you know, is going to um, uh, uh, continue to uh, to need things in ways that it's important for American society to respond to. So I, uh, these are my sources, um, and uh, I'll conclude just by um, uh, just by thanking you all for your time and attention and interest today, um, and uh, thanking Nita and uh, 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 and Costs of War for um, letting me be part of this conversation. Uh, a quick thank you to my funders as well, and to my um, friends and interlocutors in Holford, and um, to uh, to some of the folks who are involved in um, in helping with the nuts and bolts of this research. Thanks, and I, I welcome your questions. Well, thank you so much, 
Ken, that was fascinating and uh, disturbing and inspiring all at the same time. Um, I am waiting for questions to come in, but um, and I guess I'll see them in the chat, my chat screen. But I have a couple questions that I'd like to start off with. Um, first, there was something you said. I just want you to clarify for me. You said that uh, veterans are less likely than civilians to be arrested and jailed, but there are they. Uh, but I wasn't clear if they're more likely to be involved in crime. There's a there's a slide where you said it, it seemed contradictory to me. Yes, yes, and so this is uh, so. Um, uh, uh, and apologies if this was if this was unclear. The uh, so veterans as a whole are less likely than uh, than civilians to uh, to be arrested and jailed. And I think the specific figure that I shared was that um, veterans are arrested and uh, and imprisoned at half the rate of civilians for all offenses and at two thirds the rate of civilians specifically for violent offenses. What that also means correspondingly is that among offenders and among incarcerated people, veterans are a given veteran offender is more likely than a given civilian offender to have uh, been arrested for a violent crime. Um, uh, but that's uh, the the uh, it's just one of those you know those sort of like um, uh, you know associative inversions of of of, uh, of you know kind of trying to characterize statistics and words that um, that can be challenging. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It does. Um, it. Thank you for clarifying that. I I also wanted to ask you a little bit about something that um, the M hat studies uncovered. That is the uh, mental health teams in Iraq in 2007 uncovered that you talked about exposure to violence, not necessarily being a predictor of, of, uh, or combat experience, not necessarily being a predictor of incarceration rates domestically. But what they found the MHAT studies uh, in 2007 was that exposure to violence in deployment was associated with harsher treatment of civilians in Iraq. And so that's interesting to me that you that that there's this difference between what soldiers are doing abroad and what they're doing at home. Do you have any ideas? I know this isn't necessarily your your area, but I, I want to know what you think about that. And if you think the MHAT studies were not well enough done uh, to to make that claim. Yeah, no, no, and thank you for thank you for mentioning that. This is uh, this is also an opportunity, I think, to to um, to sort of further uh, clarify one of the points I was making earlier, which is that the the thing that the the thing that I feel it pains to uh, uh, to sort of highlight in terms of association is direct connection with military status or having deployed with violent crime, and so this is a, a thing that an association that we see see frequently drawn, and that among some of those those sort of mixed results studies that I cited um, all too briefly, uh, both for time reasons and because um, uh, because my own uh, my own mastery of them is is still just sort of developing, um, is that there there are some suggestions that uh, direct involvement in combat is perhaps slightly more um, associated with uh, with law breaking or with um, uh, 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 or specifically with violent crime um, in the U.S. Uh, in in addition to uh, you know in, in what would what would suggest sort of a parallel of uh, the phenomenon that you're noting in the MHAT studies um, and I don't I, those those studies are incredibly interesting and compelling and I, I in fact I would encourage anyone who's interested in more in behavioral health to um, uh, to read the studies directly there uh, a lot of the results have been written up in very accessible ways by the authors um, and there's also a wonderful book uh, by the historian Dave Kieran uh, called um, uh, Signature Wounds that describes the history of those studies and the way they were implemented and interpreted um, that's um, beautifully documented and, uh, and and really interesting and informative. Um, I think there are also some kind of bigger cultural questions about how, like what sort of causal mechanisms we as a society uh, are, are interested in 
describing or ascribing around behaviors of violence. And especially in military contexts, um, my inclination is, is always to sort of look to what the institution is doing or encouraging people to do as the kind of as the site of explanation, um, as opposed to what has somehow happened transformatively to a collection of individuals that might lead them to behave in a different way. Uh, but that's that's just as much a sort of methodological difference of you know ways to approach this really complex problem. Um, so I think that this um, I think on the on the one hand, just to, just to sort of take the the broader um, frame of your point, I think it's very very important to try to continue to study um, what these relationships might be, and I also think it's um, I think there's a, a high level of prudence that is necessary for researchers and commentators to to think about what you know what sort of narrative we're looking for in. Um, uh, in, in the way that we uh, that we choose to pursue those uh, those connections or those explanations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We have a, a question, but I just want to follow up uh, before I get to that question, because I, I note a parallel between your work and my work. Uh, in my book, Accountability for Killing, which came out almost a decade ago already. Not that uh, long ago. <laughs> well, it's 2013. I'm, but in any case, uh, what I found was that it, a parallel to what you're finding, which is the bad apple, mad apple narrative about exactly. these are bad apples or mad apples and they go do bad things versus looking at the organizational culture mm -hmm. and uh, the, the sort of larger level of responsibility there. And so I, I think that's fascinating to, to see that this um, uh, sort of focus on the individual miscreant or possible miscreant or individual hero is the narrative. And I, I really appreciated um, your focus on narratives. Um, uh, but I wanted to, uh, well, I wanna come back to a couple other things about gender and race, but let's just take this other question uh, first. Heidi Peltier asks, could you tell us what parts of the VTC model might be brought into the regular criminal justice system? What translates well, what doesn't, what obstacles are there, financial and other? Sure. Yeah, this is a this is a great question uh, that um, I will uh, I'll be answering on the basis of sort of what I know about um, about veteran courts and treatment courts. And I think there are, uh, I would just want to give the proviso that there are um, a lot of folks working um, it's sort of in, in different and more policy oriented capacities in this space um, who uh, uh, who are would also be well suited to address this question. Um, and uh, I think a, a, well, one, of, one of the things that I mentioned earlier uh, is the fact that uh, the, because veteran courts are working with a with the uh, with veterans, there exists a robust, uh, essentially welfare state apparatus that is ready at hand to serve the needs of most of those folks, including even in some cases, folks who who. Um, uh, you, you know, maybe came out of the military with other than honorable discharges, uh, but who still qualify for even some kind of limited benefits. Um, and that a, a sort of uh, parallel version of this robust uh, military welfare state does not actually exist for uh, civilians in the US. And just uh, to give a sort of ethnographic perspective on this, um, I recall one of the members of the care team in Holford telling me, like, uh, who, who had, um, uh, he was himself a veteran and he had also worked in uh, the court and, and welfare systems in various capacities. And, uh, and he was saying, I, re I recall him saying to me that uh, one of the things that was great about the veteran court was that if a court participant needed um, some form of uh, uh, drug or alcohol use treatment, um, it was usually pretty easy to get them a spot in a treatment program in a relatively short period of time, um, either because there were uh, subsid uh, sort of VA subsidized programs available or actual VA programs. Um, but that for folks in the Holford drug court that basically functioned just down the hall, um, it could take weeks or even over a month to find someone uh, a spot in treatment for literally the same offense and the same set of conditions. And that the risk, especially for someone who's a drug user of reoffending during that time 
was incredibly high, and especially when they're already under court supervision and potentially being uh, drug tested on a regular basis. And uh, and so they're just so in many ways because of the existence of these other resources, veteran courts are able to set their participants up for success in ways that civilian courts may simply just not be able to do because the resources don't exist. Um, so that's a that's a really um, a really really major one uh, that uh, that I can kind of cite in response to that question. All right. Thanks. Uh, one one thing that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about was uh, thinking about criminality and suicide at the same time. So we know that what you're telling us is in general, veterans are less likely to be criminal offenders, just in general, 50% less likely, you said, um, than the general population. But we also know at the same with the same population of veterans, they have higher suicide rates than the general population, even though the military would like to argue that other oh, actually when you account for this and that they're actually about the same. But it used to be if that's even the case, it used to be that veterans had lower suicide rates in general, uh, you know, 20 years ago than the general population. So um, what do you think accounts for the disparity there? If, if, if what you said in response to that previous question was they have much better resources, you know, so that they can deal with their criminal potentially criminal problems, which could have landed them in jail. Uh, why aren't they making, uh, or why isn't the, the resource base able to deal with their potential for suicide in the same way? Yeah, so that's a, um, this is a, a really, a really good question. And I think, you know, this is another one of these sort of like seeming contradictions that, um, that emerges in in, in the, the kind of like familiar uh, sort of like causal picture around how we um, how we think about uh, 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 veteran health and and veteran services. Um, so there are a couple different things that I would uh, want to highlight. So one is that um, yes, just to sort of affirm what you were noting, Nita, that uh, absolutely the the military suicide rate has. Um, that is among active duty service members um, is historically or was historically significantly lower than the civilian rate and consistently rose over the course of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan sometime around 2009 or 2010 surpassed and then far exceeded the civilian rate. And, uh, and actually the, um, it, it sort of plateaued at a certain point, but it is basic among service members, but it's basically stayed level at a highly elevated rate uh, above the, the civilian rate. Um, and I agree that there are many good reasons to be skeptical of some of the military claims about mitigating factors, uh, in part just because the military doesn't exist in a vacuum. The military engages in practices that um, sort of actively take advantage of or exploit other stressful factors in the broader world that it, that it exists in, um, uh, in terms of how it, how it uh, re uh, relate, uh, relates to its, uh, its, its members. Um, but coming back to the question of uh, veteran suicide, um, so the, um, just as the, uh, the bulk of veterans in the U.S. are, um, are older and from the pre-9-11 era, the bulk of veteran suicides in the U.S. are also, um, uh, also among older veterans of that era, uh, though there are specific subsets of post-9-11 veterans that are, uh, who are also at remarkably elevated risk of suicide. Um, so none of this is yet getting into the answer to your question, but the but just to, to sort of provide some broader context to it, um, it I think one way of answering uh, uh, the, the question that you pose um, lies in the fact that the suicide rate among veterans who are uh, uh, regular users of VA care is significantly lower than that among folks who are uh, kind of outside of the VA system. Um, now, this isn't like a direct one-to-one, -one, but, um, uh, but I think it's something that's especially important to uh, make mention of in the face of a lot of the, uh, the kind of um, criticism and hostility that the VA comes in for. There are some really, really important um, failings or opportunities for improvement that exist in the VA. Some of those are, are very much beyond the control of the VA system uh, itself, including the, the fact that there are currently hundreds or perhaps even into the into the thousands of currently unfilled behavioral health positions uh, in the VA um, 
and there's a there's an entire body of literature and criticism about the the sort of Trump uh, Trump era VA leadership and many of the problems that it's uh, potentially created for veteran service users. Um, but uh, uh, but just to um, uh, just as an additional piece of context, um, folks who do have access to these services are, are actually at significantly lower risk of suicide than folks who are kind of outside of contact with those services, which, which also helps sort of shift the target of where we can imagine intervention. Like intervention then becomes not a matter of folks who are kind of um, too far gone to be helped, but rather uh, becomes a problem of, of outreach and communication. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, the help, the, the extra help they have does help. Exactly, yes. Right. Okay, for both crime and suicide. Thanks, that's mm -hmm. very useful. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, we've got a couple other questions. Let's start with the one where they're asking you to return to the data on the slide showing a decline in veteran incarceration over time in comparison with civilians to talk about the impact of military policy in Vietnam versus post 2001 wars. So, and the uh, impact of the AVF and the military's ability to have more service members without the poverty and other conditions that create more incarceration. Great, let's see. So I think, okay, I'm, I'm going to take a moment to read this question again yeah. carefully and go back to this, let's see. So decline in veteran incarceration over time uh, compared with civilians. Um, talk about the impact of military policy in Vietnam versus post 2001 and um, military's ability to have more service members without the poverty and other conditions that create more incarceration. Um, okay, so this looks like a very interesting question. I'm not, I'm, uh, I apologize for, um, for maybe not getting the full uh, the full gist of it. Oh, and I realized that this, I believe the slides aren't up anymore, but I'm just rewinding myself back to that, um, uh, uh, back to that slide. Um, but a couple, I get, I can just mention a couple of things that this question is, is pointing to, which is that, um, uh, there, um, uh, there was a, a you know, a massive change occasioned by, um, the end of the draft and the beginning of the all volunteer force um, in the late 70s and, uh, and early 1980s um, that uh, sort of changed what it meant to be a service member. There are also major changes in um, veteran benefits and veteran health care that happened uh, in this period as well, uh, including the sort of expansion of service related psychiatric health care and benefits. Uh, which is something that didn't uh, that, that that really only began to exist in uh, the late '70s in the the wake of the um, the U.S. war in Vietnam, uh, basically as a product of veteran and um, veteran clinician advocacy. Um, uh, but then a, another thing that I would just flag is that um, you know this so this switch from the draft to the all volunteer force also overlaps with. Uh, the in the 1970s and early 80s, the war on crime and the war on drugs. So these are increasingly punitive policing and incarceration practices, increasingly punitive sentencing practices. Um, and it also overlaps with uh, over the course of the 80s and into the, the mid to late 90s, um, the, the kind of um, the series of reforms that uh, that sort of ate away at uh, existing social welfare programs in the United States, kind of culminating with the, the so-called end of welfare as we know it in during the Clinton administration in 1996. So the um, so I'm, I'm apologies, question asker. I, I I imagine I'm not specifically responding to um, to your question, but I do uh, um, I do think it's really interesting and important to sort of highlight this trend in changes in incarceration in terms of other really significant national level policy changes that are happening at that time. Okay, thank you. Another Please question. feel free to get back at me if I can, if I can clarify uh, that to whoever asked that question. There's time for them to write. Um, th another question is, I've seen a recent study that indicated that 36% of mass shootings in the US were committed by individuals who were trained by the military. Does that line up with anything you've found? 
Uh, yeah, so let's see. I'm not sure about the, the precise figure. It is the case that among the, the kind of, so mass shooting itself is a, is a slightly complicated category. It's, um, it's important to define because a lot of the time when we see that term, uh, we, what we think about are these relative, you know, these um, uh, very high profile, but relatively rare uh, events that involve, that happen in public places and involve large numbers of people. I believe that the sort of federal level FBI definition of a mass shooting is, is actually something with um, three or more victims, if I recall correctly. And so that actually includes many, many different kinds of crime that don't um, that don't rise to the, the, the sort of mass public attention of um, slightly larger scale and also um, more random seeming um, mass shootings. It is the case that uh, just as people with um, uh, diagnosed mental illness are somewhat overrepresented among perpetrators of those high profile mass shootings, it is, uh, it is also the case that uh, while I, I couldn't cite the exact proportion or percentage, and I'd be interesting, interested to know the citation for this specific study, um, it is the case that uh, military service members or military veterans um, are at least slightly overrepresented among perpetrators of mass shootings. But this is another one of these statistical associations that I think it's really important to pay attention to uh, because mass shootings themselves are, even though they happen with such a horrific frequency in the US, as events that it's possible to measure statistically, they are so infrequent that the actual demographics of their perpetrators, when we sort of read them backward, um, are not necessarily super helpful or, or and don't necessarily shed a ton of light on what it is that actually motivates or helps aggravate um, these events. Um, and so this is also an instance where things like um, gender, access to weapons, interpersonal relationships. Um, uh, and this, this is something that actually my colleague, uh, Jonathan Metzl and I um, have studied a bit and, and published a piece a few years ago about in the American Journal of Public Health uh, about kind of what the, um, what the actual sort of predictive basis for, for mass shootings uh, are. And, um, uh, and that, uh, Again, I think there's a there's a tendency in American society to sort of associate um, military status with um, spectacular acts of mass violence like this, uh, but that as a predictive factor, it doesn't actually hold up um, terribly well. Again, in part, in large part, because these events, while too frequent, are uh, are much too rare to actually be able to um, to sort of draw specific predictive inferences about. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna. Uh, have this be the last question because we must end, which is, is it possible, and you can answer yes or no, that the lower overall arrest rate of veterans could be explained by police giving veterans slack they wouldn't give to the general public? And we're going to take out race for mm -hmm. the moment here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and so I, one, I appreciate sort of like the subtraction of race from that question, which is a thing that I, I think actually like empirically and practically it's, um, uh, it's it, uh, it at a, at a, to answer that question systematically, we would we would not be able to do that. Like I don't think there's a I don't think it's possible to to sort of to use that as a as a systemic explanation. At uh, at a sort of anecdotal or more granular level, uh, I can say unequivocally yes, it is entirely entirely possible. Um, especially knowing what I now know about the or knowing what I've learned. Um, in the context of ethnographic research in military communities, um, there, you know, one of the most common uh, sort of uh, uh, post-military uh, career trajectories um, uh, for a lot of folks is into law enforcement, um, and uh, so the the and and uh, uh, folks in uh, my field site in Holford and uh, folks in my old my my former field site at Fort Hood. Um, uh, both described, um, uh, especially not so much in the post 9-11 era, but certainly um, in the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, and uh, this is also, also important because uh, laws around drunk driving uh, were, um, were much different, especially in the 70s and early 80s than they are now. 
um, that uh, the sort of discretion of law enforcement personnel and kind of giving a pass to um, to veteran offenders uh, or you know or people who they who they basically just knew through shared service um, was absolutely something that would that uh, that folks described happening in those communities. Um, whether that's something that's generalizable across the U.S., uh, whether it's something that is possible to sort of control for um, against the grain of racial patterns of, of targeting and arrest, uh, I think is much more complicated to say. Um, and uh, uh, and it, yeah, but I think this um, uh, uh, I think this is also a really um, th this is a, a, a very interesting and, and important question um, to uh, to think about. All right, thanks very much. And I want to thank you. Um, you know, there's an audience clapping somewhere. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, for agreeing to participate in the Cost of War Project and for giving this presentation, the first of four this semester. And those of you who want to come back next week, Wednesday, can hear Ben Suit talk about his research on veterans as well from a different, slightly different angle, uh, veteran mental health. And uh, right now, I just want to close by appreciating the Pardee Center and all the things it does to make it possible for the cost